Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jonathan Murray, uh, the founder of Buna Murray Productions, um, and we make both uh, reality shows and um, documentaries. Uh, today's webinar focuses on the challenges and rewards of creating documentary and unscripted programming that is inclusive of people with disabilities. Specifically, we'll focus on HBO's Autism the Sequel, a short documentary that is premiering tonight on HBO that is a follow-up to 2007's Autism the Musical and the unscripted series Born This Way, about seven young adults with Down syndrome and their families. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to be involved with both projects. Mm -hmm. In both, we take viewers into worlds that have often been misunderstood and often ignored by the media. How do you tell these stories so that they are honest and authentic and so that they change attitudes and promote positive social change? That's what we will primarily be exploring today. Joining us from Autism the Sequel, which premieres tonight, is producer Sasha Alpert and two of the subjects of the documentary, Adam and his mom, Roseanne. And for Born This Way, we have executive producer and showrunner Laura Kakorian and Rachel and her mom, Lori. We also have Gail Williamson from KMR Talent, who has been a pioneer in representing talent with disabilities and who represented many of the cast of Born This Way. Finally, we have Lauren Applebaum, Respectability's Vice President of Communications, who advises media companies on scripts and programming to make sure it's accurate in its portrayal of people with disabilities. If people have questions uh, as you go along, um, we'll take them at the end of each segment and you can type them into the Q&A uh, and then I'll, I'll take a look at it when we get to the question area. So we're gonna start with Autism the Sequel. Sasha, what was the hope with the original documentary Autism the Musical back in 2007? In 2007, when we were first making this film, there was a tsunami of diagnoses of, of autism. And it seemed like it was more than we'd ever seen before. And in fact, it was. There was, there was a way more people being diagnosed with autism than there had been previously. And our desire with this film was to make it, to, to make a film that showed the ability within the disability that people that were on the spectrum had certain skills and talents that other people didn't have and we wanted to put shine a light on that so we wanted to show that people had decided that people with autism would be put in a box and this is what they could do and what they couldn't do and we wanted to show in a film that there were myriad things that people could do and that in fact people with autism were all different just like people that don't have autism. We're all very different people. So did that you, was our desire. Did you have to educate yourself about autism before you took on the film? I did. I had known, I had a, uh, I'd known a lot of autistic children, but I, want, I think the key thing that I learned was what a spectrum it is. So that you, you meet one person with autism, that means you've met one person with autism. So everyone, has different skills, everyone has different abilities, everyone has different challenges, and just like anybody else, it's a, it's, it's a big spectrum and a big myriad of people. And how did you, what was your way into the film? Like how, when you were like, when you had to figure out, well, how am I gonna tell this story that I wanna tell? What was the way into it? Uh, the way in was a amazing teacher, Elaine Hall, Coach E, who was taking on, a, she, she had just started this program that she, I think it was her second or third year called the Miracle Project, which basically taught uh, students with autism how to, how to act, how to perform, but it mixed in with all this acting and performance were social skills and socialization and things that might be more challenging for people with autism, people on the spectrum. But she was on her way in because she wanted to mount a full-on musical. Everyone was so busy <clears throat> talking about what these kids could and couldn't do. She was like, I'm going to mount a huge musical with them, and it's going to be original music, and this is just what I'm doing. So the way in was to follow her. 
But in following what she was doing, we went into each family's life and the successes and failures around raising children that we all have and what it, what having children on the spectrum did to their marriages, their friendships, and their entire life. Wow. Um, Roseanne and Adam, um, were you, um, you had been part of the Miracle Project. Um, and w what did you think when um, the filmmakers uh, came to you and said, uh, we want to uh, tell this story uh, of, of, of all of you and your families uh, and what you're doing. What did you think? Well, um, this was early on in this new sort of explosion of autism diagnoses. And there was really not a lot out there except for the refrigerator mother myths of the past. And I knew that it might be a way for me to, to understand Adam a lot easier if, uh, because we would be focused, I would be focused specifically on his autism. And um, that was, I thought that was great. The other thing is that um, one of my favorite books, like everyone's is To Kill a Mockingbird. And Boo Radley, from To Kill a Mockingbird is a typical autistic person. And in that, in those days, he was like locked in a room, you know, looking out of the window, which is the kind of thing that Adam used to like to do when he was little. And so I thought it'd be really important for people to learn how to be more comfortable around what autistic people look like. And um, was, uh... Did Adam, Adam, did you enjoy the Miracle Project? Did you enjoy performing and being on stage? Yes. I just got some Wait, to say. Did, wait Adam, did you enjoy the, yes. you enjoy the Miracle Project? Yes. What was your favorite part? What? Well, uh, no, don't tell, tell us the dialogue from it. Oh, wait. Adam does really remember every movie dialogue. To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, you like that. Who I just got something to say. Oh, this is he's acting. Because <laughs> I ain't gonna be saying no more. Listen in. This is going to kill a mockingbird. We had took an advantage of me. Okay. okay. Enough, enough. Stop. And then you were fine, fucking fancy gentleman, which is a black motherfucking yellow stinking coward. Oh, okay. That's amazing. Did you have any qualms about participating, about, you know, having Adam seen and, and having your family seen? Roseanne, that question uh, no, to you. I, I didn't. Um, the thing, I have, my theory about autism is to have, that if my goal is to have Adam blend in, I'm going to fail because Adam is designed to stick out, okay? <laughs> and so um, I just think that, that um, just people kind of being, learning that this is what autism can look like. And, um, and I don't, the other thing, reason why I was really excited about being in this, that one of the old myths about autism was that African-Americans couldn't have autism because we weren't intellectually gifted enough. Wow. And so the, the good part of that was that when they were taking children away from their refrigerator mothers, they weren't taking away the black children with autism from their refrigerator mothers because the black children were automatically mentally retarded. They didn't have autism. Only white kids and could have <laughs> autism. And that's the way it was in the books, the medical books until 1978. Well, that's why I think it's important. And that's why I think it's important when we talk about inclusiveness or diversity, that we don't just think of it as someone with autism, that when we look at autism, we have to have, we have to focus on a diverse group of people. 
we just can't focus on like you know white people with autism and um yeah and especially since that myth for so many years was that african americans could not have autism and so uh it, it's so i think that was important also but remember when we started filming the first film that a lot of this stuff was still being taught in schools and um, I, I had friends who were and when I told them that my son had been diagnosed, the first thing they said was, but you were always up in his face, you know, like you were always like taking care of him. And, and I was saying, well, you know, that refrigerator mother thing is a myth. And it, I mean, it took many years for that to dissipate. Did the, um, did the project of being, process of being in the Miracle Project where, uh, Adam and the other young people were forced to sort of interact with each other, look each other in the eyes. Did you think that that had a beneficial impact on Adam, that, that experience of being in the Miracle Project? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, I have a theory of the tribe, you know. I think that uh, other people with autism are part of Adam's tribe. And even though he's been fully included in, and he's always been the only autistic student in all of his classes and in most of the programs that he's been in, I made sure that he was able to have lunch with the special ed class at the school that he was at that, that was next door to his school. So that because I said he needs to be around his people and uh, they, they need to have to understand that they're a community. And so that was another reason why I was excited about doing the Miracle Project. Um, Sasha, um, you chose not to have experts in the film. Talk to me about that decision. Because I know you wanted to shed light, but you didn't want to have, you know, <laughs> the guy in the lab coat or the person sort of explaining it all. When we first produced Autism the Musical, the first film, there was a starting to be a prevailing feeling that it was vaccinations that was uh, creating autism. And it, but but tr many scientists were debating this. So we didn't want it to be a debate about vaccinations. And we didn't want it to be about medical professionals in white coats. We wanted it to be about families and their experience and not someone else talking about what an experience would be like, but about people that were living through it having that experience. And just to um, talk about something Roseanne mentioned about refrigerator mothers, just to be sure that everyone knows what that means, it meant that the reason why kids were becoming autistic was not biochemical, but because their mother had been cold and not loving enough. And so if you can imagine being a mother with the diagnosis of autism, not only having to figure out the path forward, but also being accused of being the cause of it. So we just decided that this was about people's experiences and we didn't, in our 90 minutes, we didn't want to include doctors. Um, that, that, that could be a different documentary. This was going to be the lived experience. Okay, now suddenly it's 10, 11 years later, and now we have Autism the Sequel. What was the thought about doing Autism the Sequel, focusing on these same families? The prevailing question with parents around the time of their, of their children's diagnosis in 2007 was, what's gonna become of my child? Will my child ever have any independent life? Will they be able to um, live on their own? Will they be able to pursue their abilities and their dreams and their fantasies about the future? And so that, is, that was the, such a huge question that every parent had. So coming back and revisiting it, revisiting the life with the same group of five children, now adults, we could see what happened to these children and now adults and you know they are doing fantastic i mean we have two uh two of these kids in college we have three of these kids in college and one in a music academy we have you know someone living very happily in a group home we have some you know a, people moving out and living independently but on their own terms and in the way that it looks like for that individual person. So, you know, they are, it is a spectrum, 
So people are doing things along a spectrum. Some kids will go to college, some kids will live independently, some kids will not as adults. But this gives us the ability to see what happened to these kids when they grew up. Roseanne, what did you think when you got the call to have these cameras come back and sort of see how Adam and you are doing? Um, you, I think, in fact, you've originally lived, I think, in LA and you've moved to a new city. Yeah, um, I moved, when Adam got a full scholarship to um, 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 Berkeley College has merged with um, Boston Conservatory. Um, it was an opportunity that, you know, I just had to make it happen. There was no way I was not going to, he was not going to do it. And so um, we moved out to Boston and we got the first interstate funding of an aid, a communication <clears throat> facilitator for Adam <clears throat> through, um, in the country, we got, we got 35 hours a week. And um, that person accompanies Adam and helps him with his homework and walks with him to and from school. And um, I just thought it was really important because we've met so many parents that have, who saw the original um, Autism the Musical and their children play the cello because they saw Adam <clears throat> playing the cello. So we have hundreds of Facebook friends of parents who, who, whose kids play the cello. And when we got to Berkeley, I was stunned at how many kids at Berkeley and, and Boston Conservatory music knew, knew Adam. And it's because they had a sibling or a cousin with autism who played the cello because of Adam. <clears throat> And so oh, I, I, the, the, the autism musical was not only really important for Adam, it's been important for all of these <laughs> other families. And um, it was another good way to get the administration of the college on board and saying, look, what we're doing is new and it's going to be hard to have a, 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 a severely <clears throat> autistic student in classes. But that is, that's our journey, and that's Berkeley's journey, and we can do it. And, you know, there have been bumps in the road from both sides. I mean, there were some teachers that didn't think he should be there, but there were also some people who came up and fought for him, which has been fantastic. And so now at Berkeley, they put together, we put together the office of, not only the Office of Disability Services, but we put that with the diversity office because it's also a civil rights issue. And um, where, because a lot of the um, accommodations for people with um, special needs in colleges, none of them apply to autism. They apply to dyslexia and hyperactivity and other, other um, conditions. And so they would say, well, you could only do what's on this list. And the list did not include the fact that Adam has poor receptive language. And what does that mean? And how do we <clears throat> facilitate that? And does he need to have somebody sitting next to him to help him do it? And so that these, so we showed, we were able to actually show them do this <clears throat> while <clears throat> Trisha was in the classroom with us. So yeah, while we were uh, telling Trisha, we were also telling the administration yeah, and it's, uh, I think people will enjoy seeing the film because it's, um, it's sort of amazing to have the camera follow Adam around at the school and see how well he's functioning in his classes. Um, uh, it's really exciting. And you know, later he's gonna play for us, which I think people will really enjoy. Um, Sasha, um, I guess finally to you, um, you know, it's always challenging when making a film like this. How do you represent everyone? This was a distinct group of parents in Southern California, um, where there are a lot of good services um, in, in this unique program, The Miracle Project. Um, so what do you usually say when people say, well, that's, that's not my experience or that's, you know, whatever? Well, I think it is true that every single 
person with autism will have a different experience. But I think what was unique about the five people that we uh, had in our film is that not only did they have access to great services, but they, they created a situation where they got these great services. So, you know, they're all incredible advocates for their children. So I think there are services out there they're always trying, you know, people will always aim to have them cut back, but I think just being a great advocate for your child is, you, you will hopefully get some great services. And I think Elaine Hall, who started the Miracle Project, has been doing it in many, many places in the country now. I know it's done in Rhode Island at Brown University. She's done it in all uh, other parts of the world. So I think there are other programs like hers. But um, I just want uh, Roseanne to mention one, two, two things. One is that I wanted to mention that Adam got a scholarship, got in and got a scholarship to every single music academy that he applied to. So he's obviously very talented, but also that when Roseanne showed up at Berkeley, she met someone who said, you want to tell the story about, um, waiting, um, about how they were waiting? About for what? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll oh, yes. There was, yes. There was um, the um, Boston Conservatory had started a program a couple of years earlier for small children to, to teach them music, um, uh, autistic children. And um, when we called, when I called, I was calling different music schools to see, you know, which music school would be most interested in having Adam. And um, she said, oh, I've been waiting for you to call. I recognize your voice because I've been, we, um, I teach, she teaches um, um, music um, education and she'd been using autism the musical, it's required in her classes, all of her classes. And that's another reason why so many kids knew Adam. <coughs> we showed up on campus is because, um, is because of that. And what, what, one of the things that's been wonderful, Adam has been part of for his scholarship, he has to do a certain amount of volunteer work. And he volunteers with the smaller children that are in, in the program for autistic musicians, the younger kids. And so that's been wonderful. So he has, he gets to do, he does the same duties that the other scholarship students have to do. That's great. Um, all right, later we're gonna hear Adam play his cello for us. Um, uh, and, but now we're gonna turn to um, Born This Way, the A&E Network Unscripted series that explored the lives of seven young adults in Southern California with Down syndrome and their families. Um, Born This Way, mm -hmm including Born This Way, um, most recent season, um, a group of digital shorts called Moving On is currently available on a and E's website. And I'm happy that uh, Born This Way is, uh, you don't have to pay for A&E to see it on the website. It's available to everybody. So uh, check that out. And um, of course, one of the people who stars in that is uh, Rachel here and uh, her mom, Lori. And um, there's a wonderful episode of Moving On with Rachel as she uh, explores uh, running for president and what, <laughs> what her platform would be. Um, but I'm also joined by Laura Kikorian, uh, the showrunner and executive producer, and Gail Williamson uh, from KMR Talent, who represented most of the talent. Um, Laura, um, how much did you know about Down syndrome when you um, set off this set on this journey of making um, Born This Way? Absolutely nothing. Mm. My world and my life had not introduced me to anyone, you know, born with Down syndrome or the community. I knew a little bit about intellectual disabilities, but I hadn't met anyone or knew anyone with uh, Down syndrome. And then fortunately, through the show, I received the best education from the cast and their parents and the community. Mm -hmm. That's great. And how did you um, how did you go about casting the series? Um, mm -hmm. I know originally the plan was to focus on Southern California, and there is a pretty tight uh, community here of families uh, that participate in a lot of the same programs and things. 
Yeah, and our casting department was led by the brilliant Sasha Alpert and Megan Sleeper. And so really, and their team set out to start with organizations um, and programs where there may be young adults with disabilities and particularly with Down syndrome. And so we started in those organizations like John and Elena went to a performing arts school. So we were able to tap into that community. Then we started looking at other organizations in Southern California and in Orange County. And really just had to speak to them about, we have this idea, this is what we'd like to do. This is our goal, this is our aim. We'd love for you to spread the word. And if you had any candidates that you felt would be open to sharing their lives on camera, you know, send them to us. And so they did, we started getting people and, uh, and then through the help of Gail Williamson, because without Gail and her connection um, to the community, who could also speak a little bit about television and what our goals were as much as we had explained to her <laughs> not to exploit them in any way but to have them share their personal stories we started finding that people were more willing to at least check in and see what this is all about and i think if you ask many of the families they were like this is never going to happen so sure we'll try it <laughs> but uh, so we did a short application that they had to fill out and through a series of interviews and we had a nice pool of people to choose from but we could only choose seven and in the end, we chose the brilliant seven that we did. Um, so uh, Rachel and Lori, how did you guys hear about um, this, this potential TV series? How did you get contacted? Um, how I got contacted from the Nazareth Associate of Orange County. Um, the one that um, the, the was with us, Webster, she went into my drama class. And, and, and that's how I heard about the, the TV show you're making. Mm -hmm. I see. And um, Lori, what did you think um, about potentially having cameras follow Rachel around and potentially cameras come into your home? Yeah. Well, when Rachel told me she wanted to try out mm -hmm. for this, mm -hmm. I was just skeptical, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I said, okay, you know, yeah. she'll never get it. Let her go for it. <laughs> <laughs> and before you know it, we applied for it and I think my goal basically was I wanted the word out there about Down syndrome. I wanted people to be aware of what Down syndrome can do. And I felt the community really didn't know that. So that's why I was open to do it. And Rachel just really wanted to always yeah. do this. And yeah. it was her dream. It is my dream. Gail, um, Gail Williamson. Um, so, what did you think? I mean, um, you know, it's, it's when you enter, it's a big responsibility, obviously, to advise clients or to, because you had, um, you've sort of had an outside role in the Down syndrome community. I think you headed up one of the organizations before you segued into talent. Um, you're sort of the stamp, the, the stamp of good good uh, goodness like if you get behind it, it it hopefully it'll happen um what did you think and uh was it um scary to uh uh sort of embrace this well if you recall i went through your your prototype with you your your first attempt at at a show um right. and so that by the time we came to born this way i i was pretty on board and, and knew knew your heart John and knew what was what you were trying to do and what you intended to do at that time, um, but yeah, in the very beginning, it it was kind of um, well, it, it was just trying to figure out you know where you guys were coming from and what it was you were doing. Yeah, but no, it, it you guys came on board and loved the community, and you've done more for Down syndrome than you know. I I look at moments, you know, life goes on was a defining moment. Um, when it was on in the late 80s because it showed us a teenager with Down syndrome and some of the things that they could do and that kind of gone away and you came about and, and gave us and then we, we also had uh, Glee and and, and yes we had, we had episodic television but getting this reality view getting people's allowing people into the homes and I think you know from my experience as Part of the Down syndrome community as a mother of an adult with Down syndrome and the people I talk to and the conferences I go to, I think almost your parents became as big, as big if not maybe bigger stars sometimes than your youth because that's who people clamored to meet when we'd be at a convention 
people who want to talk to the parents, they saw role models for the first time. And they saw other people who were going through the things that they were going through. You know, and if you don't, especially if you're in a smaller town, like in Southern California, us moms are able to kind of form our own little tribes. But there were a lot of people that were really isolated in smaller towns and they could turn on this, the TV and see this group and, and feel connected and feel affirmed in, in their roles as parents. Yeah, um, it's um, Lori. Um, so uh, it is sort of amazing how charismatic all of the families are. I mean, um, we found we we actually looked at um, you know casting Rachel and Megan and the others first, but then you know when we asked like the parents to come in to meet them, it was like oh my God, the apple doesn't fall from the tree. Um, <laughs> Really great. Um, so, uh, Laura, um, so you found six young adults, um, all in from the Southern California area. And then how did Megan end up in the series? Because she wasn't part of this Southern California community. Mm. Well, yeah, originally we wanted seven. Our goal was to have seven young adults from Southern California. And um, at the end, we did have an applicant who um, had to drop out, it just wasn't the right time for them. So we were just in the beginning of filming. So we went to the um, Down Syndrome, the National Down Syndrome Cong Congress Convention. Did I say that right, Gail? NDSC, yes. And uh, in Florida, we were filming, we were following Sean and Sandra. And um, there was a young woman who was kind of curious about the cameras and was asking some questions and um, she had this wonderful line called Megology. And so the cameras were just kind of focusing on all the different vendors and booths. And uh, they came back, the team came back from filming. And I said, did you guys meet anyone there? You know, and everyone knew we were only looking for families in Southern California. And they're like, no, but there's this one young woman and she was kind of interested in television and following us around. I said, put her mom on the phone, let's call her. And we called Chris and Megan, we interviewed them. And Chris said, it's been Megan's dream to come to California and pursue mm -hmm. yeah. you know, film and television as a producer. And we're like, you wanna come? They're like, our bags are packed. I think they were here within a week. Mm -hmm. um, I so we that's, what, that's why this is a reality show and not a documentary because um, we essentially recruited someone to sort of join our little world. Um, and it was sort of fun because we got to see it through Megan's eyes who was sort of new to this world. Um, uh, back to Lori and Rachel. Um, yeah. So Rachel, what was the audition process like? Um, I went to a couple of groups of, of the auditions. Like the first audition, I was in a, a group of, of a bunch of friends, and I made the final group, and I finally got on the show. So I, I um, was in a lot of groups. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that was to test the chemistry, uh, how you all sort mm -hmm. of bounced off of each other um, and also to see whether you know you get yeah whether you'd get, get very quiet um, and you didn't yeah. get very quiet <laughs> no, um, no no so um, you know um, so Laura what was the story engine for born this way like you know this is a doc docu series it's not like there's competitions the cast is going to be doing how do you know there's going to be story like, what was your faith that there would be story? Well, I think these seven were in this prime of their lives, you know, in their um, early 20s and 30s. And so at a time in their life where so many of them had been um, desiring and craving independence and had goals they wanted to reach and experiences that they wanted to have. And their parents had done an amazing job of giving them all these tools mm -hmm. to achieve these goals. And now it was time for them to sort of launch so I think the search for independence is something incredibly relatable. And we knew that the cast was just ready to fly. And so if we just pointed cameras their way and gave them a space to do that, it was going to happen. And we yeah, did, did meet with them and really talk about their goals so that we knew what they wanted to achieve. Right. Um, and one of the things that um, um, Rachel did was uh, she and Megan, I think, was it she and Megan? moved yes. into their own apartment to try yes. out yes. independent yes. living? Yes, yes, uh, yes. And what did you got, uh, Rachel, um, yes. what did you think when that was sort of pitched to you, the idea of you and Megan mm -hmm. living in an apartment together? 
I'm, I was nervous and, nervous and scared moving in with Megan, so I know we'll be okay. Ever since that, that was a great experience for me living with Megan. And now, since I think I got that experience, now I just got my own apartment too. Yeah, I know that. Um, you got your HUD voucher so you could have your own place, and we'll talk more about that later. Okay. Um, Lori, what, were you parked out front, like in the car secretly, like <laughs> in front of the apartment oh, they were me in? And, me and Chris, <laughs> Meg's mom, we met every day for breakfast, <laughs> and we just let all our feelings out <laughs> of how we felt and how nervous <laughs> we were, and whether they were going to call us or text us, <laughs> and but... Um, it was really hard, but yeah. it was the greatest experience because yeah. I know it was something Rachel's always wanted to do. So yeah. I wanted her to have that experience. Yeah. If I can uh, chime in for a minute, what was yeah. so great about that is, you know, that was season three. In season one, when I talked to Rachel about, you know, would you ever move out of your mom and dad's house? Mm, no, I don't think so. And, and so Rach, it was Rachel that approached us in season three yeah. and said, I would like to try out living on my own with Megan, who was ready to also try to move it out on her own. I yeah. think I was more concerned about it than they were. Um, <laughs> but it really came, the, the initiative and the drive came from Rachel. And you'll later yeah. hear how, how yeah. life is different today as a result of that experience. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of, um, you know, Born This Way covered so many interesting issues um, from preparing for independence, like getting your own place, to employment. Rachel, you have yes. a job, right? You you go yes, to I work. I have a job. Yes. I guess I have a job and they're really nice people. Hello. So we got to see. I've been I'm working there for um, it's gonna be um, eight years and it's gonna be nine years this July. Yeah, so when you were making Born This Way, you almost had two jobs. You had your regular yes. job, and then you had your I, Born This it. Way job. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, that was pretty a handful. <laughs> I got used to it. I'm I'm used to that. Um, one of the um, sort of um, most captivating shows was when you decided to explore um, sex education, with, oh, you know, yes. uh, because a lot of times when people mm. sort of think of people with disabilities or people with um, Down syndrome, they sort of tend to think very flatly mm. about it. They don't yeah. see these rich, full lives. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Laurel, how did that come about? And um, I bet that was interesting territory <laughs> as you approached everyone. It was, and it turned out to be a fantastic episode. And mm -hmm. um, so I think it started with, like John Lithu said, in terms of, again, <clears throat> showing that young adults with Down syndrome are no different than the rest of us. And they were all in their 20s and 30s and mm -hmm. curious about sex and wanting to talk about it. I actually think that was the one time I remember when we were all together Oh, yeah. You know, at leaps and bounds, and everyone was so serious. They brought out their notebooks. They had prepared questions. And, you know, you hear them like, we're going to talk about sex. God only knows where this is going to go. Um, but uh, so we knew it was a topic we hadn't covered in the previous seasons. And everyone was really interested in talking about it and learning. So I consulted Gail, who was then able to uh, direct me to an expert in the field who um, runs a lot of programs for young adults with Down syndrome on sex education. And she was phenomenal and came in and it just ended up turning out to be a really fantastic episode an funny. experience for all of us <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it was great um and and uh lori uh, when you saw that episode did you feel good about um rachel's participation in it i did i mm. i kind of knew where rachel was at so i was pretty prepared for pre basically everything but i think the amazing thing about that specific episode is when we've been out in the community and out in this different state, they always bring up that episode. Oh, yeah. And they always bring up how they use that in their schools. Mm -hmm. So that's what I found very interesting. So I think it turned out really well. And I love the lady who did that. Yeah. Haley. Uh, Gail, back to you. I mean, you're so uh, plugged in in the, um, in the disability community. Um, when you, you know, you must have heard from people. So what do you think the impact of Born This Way was um, for families out there? Well, I kind of touched on that a little earlier, but um, I, I think it validated families. It validated individuals with Down syndrome. It validated their siblings because they saw other siblings 
and they saw their intersection. It validated parents who were living the life. I mean, the interesting thing is us living with Down syndrome are pretty much living good lives. It's a different life than we had anticipated, but it's, it, I don't think many of us would trade it for the world because we're, we're introduced to this beautiful community of, of um, creativity and looking at things differently. And, and uh, we, we parents feel kind of blessed. I mean, there, there are those situations, of course, there aren't, but, but, but pretty much we feel pretty blessed. And people think we're crazy. So it was lovely to see a show that shared that. And I think some people who don't know anyone with Down syndrome went away thinking they're blessed and uh, probably have even gotten involved in the community. I'm sure Laura may have stories of that where people who saw the show went, wait, these are my people now. I need to go and, and be a part yeah, of it. No, certainly, uh, certainly the crew came away from this um, feeling that mm -hmm. these are my people. Um, Lauren Applebaum. Um, both with documentary and with unscripted shows like um, Born This Way. Um, talk to me about the power of storytelling and media representation and uh, its potential to change attitudes or reduce stigmas. Of course, thanks. So um, as, as you all know, people with disabilities really have been uh, erased by films and television up until much more recently. and. Um, you know, autism, uh, the musical and autism sequel, as well as Born This Way, really have helped change that and pave that way. Um, fully one in five people have a disability, and the majority of folks in the U.S. have a loved one with a disability. And by simply showing more people with disabilities on screen, we help bring disability, um, to use a metaphor from the LGBT community, out of the closet and into the open. Because um, really what people see influences how they feel and act. And so when people with disabilities to be, excuse me, when people with disabilities are shown to be successful on screen um, in having jobs, et cetera, then employers are more likely to hire folks with disabilities. Parents will be more likely to have higher expectations of their children with disabilities, treating them the same way as their child without a disability. And by promoting success stories of people with disabilities, for example, Born This Way helped to change the negative perceptions of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I'd also like to add that telling disability related stories is not only like the right thing to do. And I know you didn't do these, the, these films in the show just because you thought it was the right thing to do, but it's also a very smart business model as the disability market is worth uh, $1 trillion. Okay. Wow. Um, well, I want to bring back um, Roseanne and Adam and Sasha now, because I want to um, explore how the coronavirus is impacting all of you. Um, Rachel, um, yeah. you were saying you, you, know, you got a HUD voucher and you got your yeah. own place, but yes. I see you're at, your, at, at Lori and Gary's house. Yes, I'm at my parents' house. Um, so when I was at my apartment, my brother um, gave me some advice. I uh, think my brother Jonathan, um, he gave me advice to come to my mom and dad because um, we both um, don't Start feel comfortable being at my apartment by myself. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So you guys are uh, you guys are isolating together. So <laughs> yeah, Dad, boring, yeah. uh, Rachel was gone for what? Two, three two months. months. Two months I've been gone. Two months. And what's I, have to, um, I have to say it was an adjustment, but it was because of the show, it was yeah. so much easier. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and she's been on her own and we yeah. decorated the place together and it's been yeah. awesome. And it's a shame this happened, but we just did not want her to be stuck in an apartment yeah. all by herself yeah. for a couple yeah. of months. So we yeah, asked her if she wanted to come home and she chose to. Her brother said, I, my brother I would do the same thing. So she decided to come home. And yeah. Rachel. I my brother's advice. Come on. Mm -hmm. Find advice. Rachel, are you, um, are you temporarily not going into the office? Are you, are you sort of furloughed or I'm not sure uh, what the right I word is. I haven't been in the office for like a month. They closed the office. So I haven't been working at all, but thanks to my great boss, um, he gave me, um, a bonus, so I get paid for this. Oh wow! And did you yeah. also get a uh, stimulus check? Yes, but I haven't gotten that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I will be getting that soon. 
Lori, uh, uh, did you and Gary get a stimulus check? No. No? <laughs> about, well, my correct, hmm. probably very little, about $70. <laughs> but it was oh, a little wow. something. All right. Um, and um, Roseanne and Adam, um, uh, the coronavirus, how has it impacted uh, your lives? Um, I assume that um, Adam can't go into Berkeley School of Music right now. Yes, well, he's been doing uh, classes on Zoom. In fact, um, at one o'clock today, he had his um, one o'clock hour um, Eastern time, he had his um, ensemble final. And oh, he, nice. they put him on first, and then he was able to come and do this show afterwards. Wow. And um, after this is over, he's got um, his he's got a piano, his oh. piano teach. He is he has to take piano also at wow. the school, and so that that's being done online. And we have a keyboard here that he uses, but the, all of the classes are online, and they don't know what's going to happen next fall. So we don't- If there's a, not a coronavirus. If there's not a coronavirus, he'll go back, you know, he'll be back in the classes. But right now, nobody knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, and how have you guys been impacted financially? Um, uh, did you, uh, you know, did you get, did Adam get a stimulus check or uh, did you get- We're expecting one. We're expecting one. We haven't gotten it yet. It hasn't come yet because it's supposed to be directly deposited into his account. And um, it has an, um, it has something, uh, they ask, it's done through the tax. The right, income right. Tax. Yeah, well, let's go um, to Lauren yeah. Apple. So we, we sent him all the paper. Yeah, we sent him all the paperwork, but nothing has come through yet. So I don't know if it's just, you know, a delay or, if it's something we're going to have to revisit and see what's going on. Lauren, um, what is the uh, situation for people with disabilities and um, uh, the stimulus check? Sure, that's actually something that we at Respectability were really involved with trying to trying to make a difference. Um, so folks who are you know who are SSI recipients, for example, um, there there was some back and forth, but we're we're very happy that. Um, they should be automatically receiving their, their stimulus checks, their economic impact payments directly to their bank accounts by debit card or by check without filing a tax return. And furthermore, what is really important for folks who are receiving, um, furthermore, for people who are receiving government benefits, this is considered a rebate. So it means it does not affect um, their ability to continue receiving government benefits, which was a concern for many people with a variety of disabilities. That's great. And I understand um, Respectability has also been working on um, the SNAP program because some people with disabilities, um, you know, receive what used to be called food stamps. And, um, but with social distancing, um, for instance, if you're blind, how do you social distance when you go to the grocery store? Um, how is how is that all working out? So uh, access to food, food security is 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 an issue very important to all of us at Respectability, and it's something we've been working on for more than a month now. And um, as you mentioned, it you know people with disabilities, who especially those living on their own, um, have limited access to food. And so what we're okay. trying to make happen, and my colleague Philip Conpoli, who is our policy director, is really working to ensure that people who receive SNAP can use them for online grocery deliveries, uh, mm -hmm. meaning that they don't have to physically go to the store to use them. A version of this <laughs> is helping in cities like Los Angeles and New York City, um, but most of the country has no such options. Um, you mentioned about social distancing. Um, I think that there are several different uh, people with disabilities who uh, social distancing become much more of an issue. Um, some members of our immediate team have a personal care assistance, um, people to help them get dressed and eat. Um, however, those personal care assistants could bring the disease into their homes without realizing because they could be asymptomatic. And if that happens, there's a whole other issue now of risk of medical rationing, um, and which is happening 
um, not only around the world, but in some states right now, where it's a very recent fear that people with disabilities might not receive the care that they need should they come down with COVID-19. And then for folks who are blind, as you mentioned, touch is a part of our everyday experience, even more so when you cannot see. And so um, when, uh, when people around them don't take distancing seriously, it can really result in some real consequences. I wanna share that one of our, our board members, Oli Cantos, his uh, 20 year old triplet blind sons, currently all of them are battling COVID-19. And um, mm -hmm. despite themselves quarantining for more than a month after returning from college, um, you know, they all got the virus most likely from someone who lives in the house with them, bringing it into the house without realizing because that person was asymptomatic as well. So uh, it really goes to show that even if you think um, the importance of uh, self-isolating and keeping your distance from others, because even if it's not for yourself, it could be for someone else. Great. Well, thank you for that information. It's great the work that uh, you and the others are doing. Um, all right. Well, um, this is our one. We're going to bring this to an end, but we're going to do it in a really fun way because Adam has agreed to play something for us on the cello. Um, again, um, you can watch uh, uh, Autism the Sequel on HBO tonight, but it's also going to be available on their YouTube channel for free for those of you who don't have HBO. And um, Born This Way, Moving On, um, some wonderful uh, shorts, including one on Rachel running for president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that will give you a nice break from our own presidential election that will be happening soon. Um, I'm on the Rachel team. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so lots of great stuff out there. Um, thank you all for participating in this. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, let's hear from something from Adam. What, uh, uh, Roseanne, what's Adam going to play for us? Okay. LG oh. from 9-11. Okay. Yes. Um, one of the things that's been wonderful about him being at conservatory and why it's important that people with disabilities be able to go to real schools in order to get, um, to, to get the um, education they need to make music is that he's been taking composition class and he's been, and this is an original composition that he wrote and uh, um, that, um, and he's been writing fugues and all kinds of things. He, when he got to college, he didn't know how to write music at all. And so in the short time that he's been at college, the last five, four semesters, he's um, learned how to write in certain different claps. He's learned how to write different kinds of music. He's taken music theory. He's taken jazz music theory. He's taken counterpoint and harmony. And so this is a piece that he wrote, and it's called what? What is your piece called? Adam, what is your piece called? LG from 9-11. LG from 9-11. He wrote it about 9-11, okay? So here, right. you ready to play it? Okay. Come on. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Thank you. 
Thanks. Wow, that was great. Thank you, Adam. That is, yeah. you are very talented and it's great <laughs> that uh, you're at mm -hmm. Berkeley School of Music and really, you know, continuing to set example for, for everyone, whether they have a disability yeah. or not. Um, very impressive. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's, that's uh, I think, everything. Um, so thank you again, all of you. Thank you, uh, thank you. Rachel and Lori. Thank you, thank Lauren. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Gail, uh, Rachel and Adam, Sasha, Laura. This has been really uh, a nice break from <laughs> regular yeah. day. Uh, all great to see your wonderful uh, faces. Um, so thank Stay you. Here. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.